Welcome to Testimony Time with me, Doug Harris. And joining me today is not one person, is not two peoples. It is three people. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, let, let me right. explain uh, what's happening here. Um, some of you will have seen Sheldon, Sheldon Thomas. Uh, we uh, did a program which is going out in conversation, which deals with your whole um, uh, ministry of reaching out to mm. those gang members. Mm. Um, uh, tag, gangs line. T tell us briefly, if you would, just a little bit what that is. Well, Tag is an outreach response team made up of ex-gang members who are all born-again Christians. And basically what we do is that we go out into the most deprived, run-down, no-go areas in, in the UK, um, starting with London, of course. And we deal with gangs in a different way to what everybody else deals with them. We look at various things. We look behind the facade because a lot of gang members um, believe their own hype and it's a lot of um, hype. And basically, they're in pain, they've got emotional problems, they've got problems. We've got one gang member that told, spoke to me a few months ago to said that he hadn't even had a square meal. He cannot remember the last time his mum made him a square meal. So we're not talking about kids that eat at a dinner table like most of us. We're not talking about kids that's got nice furniture in their house. We're not talking about kids that even got fathers in their house. We're talking about kids that's seen serious damage going on, domestic violence, rapes, um, see their sister get abused, um, drugs, guns. These things are the experiences of the gang members we're growing up with. So these people are not exactly gang members. If you look at them differently, they're actually being kids who have been neglected. We've got two <clears throat> with us uh, today that uh, a lot of what you said there, I know I've read their testimonies, it comes uh, in their testimonies. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Riddle, yeah. thank you for joining us today. We're going to hear from you in just a minute. I'm going to start with Gavin on the end, Gavin McKenna. Um, Gavin, can you describe some of your early, which I know were very traumatic years, uh, help the viewers understand where you came from and what happened to you? Um, my dad was a Pakistani Muslim, uh, my mum's Irish, Catholic, and um, my dad was really abusive, you know, like, towards me and my mum physically. So like, I've got scars where he punched my head open and he beat my mum in front of me, raped my mum in front of me. Um, he would, like, urine on my mum, lock us in a room, just leave us there for days on end with no food. So I was hungry, I was hurt, worried, scared. Um, me and my mum couldn't engage. Anytime my mum tried to care for me, he would beat her up because he was kind of jealous, you know. So from an early age, I was exposed to a lot of violence and trauma. And then I got to about four or five and he kidnapped me and tried to take me to Pakistan. And um, he had false passports, he took me from my home. Um, he was drink driving, put a gun in my face, um, stabbed my uncle in front of me, punched me in my back, uh, threatened I'll never see my mum again. And uh, it was an eight hour ordeal, you know, and throughout them whole eight hours we had police chases, guns, knives, violence. It was just, it was the worst eight hours of my life, I think. And you, you were only about five then? Yeah, you said four, at that five. time. Mm. How, how did you survive that? Well, at the time I didn't know. Now I know it was only good, you know, yeah. because <laughs> I don't, thinking about it is scary, yes. you know. I, I don't know how I survived, you know. Mm. And. What, what was your relationship? Because I, I think your dad moved out of your life mm. uh, soon after that. What, what was your relationship like with your mum? I mean, because you almost had to redevelop it all mm. over again, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, um, when we left my dad, we fleed from him. Um, the police caught up with him eventually, we went to women's refuges. And I was very isolated and like, I was secluded as an individual. I really didn't want to know nobody. And my mum would try and mother me, but I was so used to not having it, I just rejected it. And then again, you've got to understand and respect that my mum had a lot of issues in regards to what she went through with my dad. So it was really difficult living in a women's refuge around women and kids I didn't know, a mother I didn't even know, so emotionally, you know. And then we grew out of that. My mum suffered with mental health issues that struggle, that bring a struggle upon us again. And then when my mum had my little sister from a next relationship, we kind of started getting on again because I started, she started to be more of a mum because she dealt with her issues. I dealt with mine and we started getting on a bit, but I had a little sister to play with, so I was normal again, if I can use that term. Mm -hmm. I started living from the age of six. So, yeah, we, we got on well from six to about 14. It was really nice. And um, let's just take a step further and we'll, we'll start talking to Daniel and find out about his early life. But what then happened? I mean, 
okay, you had a very traumatic beginning. It seemed to be getting better, certainly from a natural perspective. What happened to move you into the whole gang um, warfare and, 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 and the whole uh, living in that style? Again, like from that young first six years of my life, you know, I, I had so much going on and I kind of held it in. From three years old, I was under the child psychiatrist. So I had a lot of going on. And when I hit about 14, I had lots of dreams on the build up to 14 about my dad and watching my mum be raped in my sleep. And I started getting freaked out. Like, I asked my mum, I confronted her with aggression. I was like, you need to start telling me stuff. And she told me. And something in me ticked. And I just went mad. Like, all of that I held in, mm. I started smoking weed. I started hanging around the estate I lived on. And all of that oppressed anger just started erupting like a volcano, you know, like a shaken bottle. I just got opened up now. And, and that was an outlet for me. I let everything go. I started getting into the gang violence because that was my way out. You know, the oppressed anger was coming out. Like, fighting was always something I did. And I enjoyed it in a sick way. You know, and then again, I saw knives and guns when I was little. So when I grew older, seeing it again was nothing to me. You know, handling it and being around that lifestyle was all I knew. Raised voices, my instinct, instinctive to me was to fight. You know, verbal arguments, I'll start hitting people because I had no understanding of how to do with a, a situation without fighting. So, yeah, it just opened doors for me, you know. Absolutely. Maybe just quickly, Sheldon, can, can, can I just ask you, I mean, sometimes people say we, we always use upbringing as an excuse as to why, but, I, I mean, you have obviously feel that what these guys suffer really does affect them genuinely. It's, it's not an excuse. Oh, it's not an excuse, and I think this is where governments go wrong because people are human beings with emotions. And when you live in a life of trauma, trauma, you need psychological help and psychological therapy and counselling. In our case, we believe in Christian counselling. And we believe that that's where TAG fits in. Because we are all coming from those experiences, when a young person tells us of their life and where they're coming from, we can dissect it and break it down and make them reflect on how we can actually control that behaviour and how they can go on to be a better person. I think what happens in society, we think one size fits all. Because one person um, has come through a trauma experience and, and has not turned to gang violence, we assume that everybody else is going to fall into that category. So I think that... We need to understand God created us individually and we're unique. And because of that uniqueness, it requires a unique program. And I think that's the problem. We don't take the time to, under, to take out. And I think what Jesse Jackson did in my life was he took the time to give me a personal advice, personal touch and an understanding and clarity of where I fit in and where God is and Jesus Christ is in my life. And I think that's what needs to happen to here. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to do. All right, great, thank you. And I know you guys do, and we'll come on to that for you, Gavin. But Daniel, let, let me come to you first of all. And tell us a little bit about your early years and what led you in the end to get into games. Okay. Well, by the age of four, my parents separated. So I was living in North London, so my mum moved to South London. Moving it on, I got to about 14. I was missing my dad, but I didn't actually know I was missing my dad. So I was trying to seek love. I was trying to think, how can I seek love? So I thought, OK, I'll go on the streets. The streets love me. My friends love me. It was like a unit. They liked the same things I like, did the same things together. So mm -hmm. that's what I kind of got involved with, mm -hmm. that kind of life. And it's interesting, I mean, because... I think it's often said if, if people don't know love in their family or in their, they, they look elsewhere yeah. uh, because we need that love. I mean, human beings, it, and, and that's really what happened to you. You thought, OK, where can I find love? I can't find it here. Where is it? Yeah. Was it as simple a decision as that for you? It wasn't really a simple decision. What it was, I kind of fell into it because I wanted to make myself feel happy. I thought, OK, I'll go on the roads, I'll make money. I can go raving, I can take girls out, I can put petrol in a car, I can do things I want to do, which kind of sidetrack me from thinking about I need love in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe quite early on in, in this experience, you, you saw death pretty close up. But tell, tell us about that experience and what it did for you as well. OK, the first experience was my friend's birthday. We went to Streatham Ice Rink. And everyone's all skating, having a nice time. Someone comes in with a gun, shoots someone. The guy just drops to the floor. I was like, did that really just happen right in front of me? Then the next case was I was in Creighton. My friend was going to university, having a little party. 
outside, those two guys fighting. He got stabbed in the eye, he got stabbed in the head. He just dropped to the ground. Blood was just pouring out of him, and that just, not turned me crazy, but it made me feel sad inside that I've actually seen someone die right in front of me, and their mother hasn't got a child anymore. They can't bring back that life that they've taken. Mm. And I think sometimes what happens is they don't, people don't understand that when you see that at a young age or as a teenager, no matter how strong you may be mentally, you will be f scarred and, and it does have an effect on you. And this is why I think where the body of Christ could come in, because I believe that we're the only ones who've got the real answers to dealing with scars, emotional hurts, pains, especially past hurts. And I think that when you have somebody like Daniel and the Gavins of this world, um, it's a mischance. You know, the body of Christ, is, this, this is a mischance if we don't understand that, we, that the world needs to look to us. Because at the moment, everybody's looking to the world for the answers, the government. I think what needs to happen, the world needs to look to us, the body of Christ, to lead on these answers. Because what Daniel experienced and what Gavin's experienced, many guys are experiencing it right now as we speak. Mm. Um, there were young men out there that me and Gavin work with that are coming from some... We just came from a family home um, in East London where 30 men try to rush the house from both sides, throwing bricks through the window, and then try to kick the front door in with the dad in the house. Mm. So it's quite clear these guys are hurting guys who, and there's a saying, hurting people hurt other people. And so these guys don't know how to control their right. anger. Yeah. They don't know how to control those hurts. So yeah. I think we need to kind of take a step back and understand these young people are just neglected, um, need a sense of belonging, and they have no love in their life. Absolutely. Gavin, um, I think for many of us looking on from the outside when we see gang violence portrayed um, on, on our televisions and that, we think nobody can really be content with what they're doing. I mean, what was it like for you to be in gang warfare? Were you content with it? Were you... Uh, because of all this anger, this is the way I'm going to live. What, what struggles were going on in your life? I guess uh, some people would say I had a choice, which I did, but it was an influence behind the decisions I made, and it was my past. So daily I struggled, you know, waking up with that in, on my head. That, uh, I watched my mum be raped, you know. I was conceived through rape, you know. Mm -hmm. I saw someone get stabbed, uh, seen a gun. It did. It, you didn't wake up thinking about it daily, but you dealt with the problems daily. And... It had a traumatic impact in my life because the rage allowed me to be gang warfare, have gang warfare in my life, but my heart broke every time because I, I wasn't that person, but I was forced into, like, I, I was led and influenced by my rage. So daily I woke up with anger in my heart, a struggle to eat because my life was rough, you know. I, never, I had holes in my shoes, you know. I, I used to have to rob mobile phones to eat dinner because my mum couldn't feed me, so... And she tried her best. I want to honour her, you know, because she really tried. But it's hard to bring up a child in a rough estate with three other kids. So daily I struggled and I cried in my bed. So I could go out, hold a gun, knife or stab someone and I'll come home and be sad. Nothing changed. Mm. But for that split second of the violence, I felt relieved from something. Mm. But long term, I was just struggling and I just wanted to, I wanted to be a child again, you know. I didn't want to be this angry ogre. I wanted to be loved and known for who I really was. Do you, do you think... From your experience, that's true of many, most of the people in, in the game. And as Sheldon has said here, um, that really what you see, you see the violence, you see the knives, you see the guns, but actually inside they're very different people. Do, do, do you th and then it's probably not true of all, but do you think it's true of many? Yeah, I do agree because, again, that if we know the psychological aspects of a human, that part of the brain works from experience called learnt behaviour. Now, what allowed me to be comfortable around that environment was the learnt behaviour. But my heart, again, wasn't, I wasn't born that kind of person. Mm. I was brought up that kind of person. You know, through experience, not through my mum and that. So, again, it's adapting to what you know. So I knew it, so I adapted to it, but did I really want to be it? No. And I think most of those guys, we get in, like Daniel, my brother, we get in for love, money, lust, whatever, but then we end up with a whole different package, violence, mm. looking over your shoulder, your family going through trouble, you know? So again, I guess it, most, most people in my position, I can speak for myself and others I know of, it was clear that that mm. was the case. 
And Daniel, w would that be true of you as well? Uh, w was there a struggle or did you enjoy it? I mean, what, what was your emotion? To a certain extreme, I did enjoy it because it sidetracked me from thinking about love. But okay. deep down, I was still hurting inside. Mm. That pain wasn't getting taken away. It was still there. So for a split second, I wouldn't think about it. But when I got home and I laid down in my bed, I'm thinking, you know what? I need to be loved. Mm. Where is this love? Mm. I still haven't got it. I still need to find it. Right. I think you'll find that most adults themselves struggle with um, knowing who they are and their, 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 their love. Yeah. And I think when we look at teenagers, we think they're supposed to come ready-made, you know. Oh, here's a teenager, you've seen all of that, oh, get on with life. Let's just, yeah. you know, don't worry about seeing your mum getting raped or whatever. Just get on with it. Mm -hmm. I think people need to think about that. And I think in Daniel's case, he's, you know, his issues around his dad, there are many men like that. Mm -hmm. there, there are so much men we work with, uh, gang members and who have no fathers in earth and the society actually thinks it's okay. They say, oh, well, so what if you didn't grow up with your father? What they don't understand is that, you know, in a biblical sense, God believes in family, which is a man and a wife, you know, mm. or a, a man and a woman. And, you know, we, we can't just say that, part, that is not needed now. We just, it don't matter. What we're saying is, is that we need to go back to basics. We've got to understand the order of life. And I think what TAG does is that we try to bring that order back into their very individual lives because we want people to understand that yes you may not have a father figure but we're gonna not be the father but we'll be mentoring you so that you can actually begin to change your life so that when you have a child you know what not to do amen gavin this program's called testimony time and uh, so we, we we've dealt with the bad <laughs> and the ugly <laughs> let's deal with the good tell us how did Christ get hold of your life and change you from what you were to what you obviously are today? Well, I was on like a football-based probation and um, I met a guy from Tottenham and he was, we, we started hanging together. We both came from different areas and um, we started, we were doing gang violence, just two of us, you know, we thought we were Super Mario Brothers or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we just rode around, just robbing people, fighting. And then one day he came to my house to do a bit of weights. And he's like, I want to go, I've been going to church, you know, and I just looked at him like, what? Because I've been to church and someone prophesied over my life. And really? it's actually come to pass today. So I've been to church, but I didn't know church, you know. And I just followed him as my friend. I went with him. I sat in City Gates Christian set in Ilford. And Pastor Steve Darby, she was preaching. And I just sat there looking at this guy preaching. I just thinking, what's he talking about? Uh, you know what I mean? I'm just looking around for girls and that, if I'll be honest. And then I realized, yeah. and then he said something alarmed me. In life, we have positive voices and negative. And I looked at him, and I'm, just, I'm like, he's talking to me right now. <laughs> then he went on, your mum, your dad, your sister, and I cried like inside, I was looking. And my friend just looked at me and tapped me, I was like, I'm all right. I went home, I was like, yeah, mum, I want to be a Christian. Remember, I was this gang, I had yeah, guys yeah. come to the house with guns, and my mum was like, what? <laughs> You've been, all right, then. I got told to get out with that rubbish, yeah. to be polite. And then um, I went, I said, all right, cool, went back, I said, look, this ain't gonna work, you know, mate, I don't think this is for me. And the pastor put his hand upon my shoulder and he said, there's a hope here for you. And I just cried mm. and I was crying and I said, please let me see this positive. Because I identified positive in my life it was not there. Negative was there for years. And then I kept going to church, church, church. And then one day I just gave my life. I, I was resisting God. I was like, no, Jesus, not now, not now. And then my friend tapped me. And you know, I just got led and I just went to the front. I was like, look, I'm late, but I want to give my life, you know. And I went in the back, I'd done the prayer, and I just came out like, whoa, I was on fire. And then I just, I had an up and down, up and down walk with God. And sure. then one day I just went to church and a woman come from Germany. I started talking about people being molested. And once I was saved, someone said to me, would you, tr would you forgive a pedophile for touching your sister? And I mm. looked and said, what? This is before I was saved. And he goes, if you can't, then don't do Christianity. And I said, no, I can't do it. <laughs> I got saved. Six months later, I found out my sister got molested. Mm. Now... Instantly, I wanted to go and shoot this guy, and the gun was there. I was ready. I saw him, and I, I was sitting in my car. I just stared at him, and I said, you know what? Let God deal with you, and mm. I drove off. I went home and broke down. I just cried like a baby, and I said to God that day, I can do anything, you know? I can do anything, and me and God's relationship went deep, and that lady... I was going to say, but it's because of the, what the Spirit of God was doing within was you, isn't real. it? It's it amazing. Was, God was apparent to me, you know? Yeah. And letting go of my dad. Yeah. My, my pastor mentored me as well, Steve McEwen, and 
He came in and he said, pray for your dad. I, I said, Heavenly Father, and I cried. I said, nah. Mm -hmm. He says, you ain't dealt with him then. And, only, and I, started, I started struggling, wrestling in the spirit. I said, nah. And I went to church one night and the lady said, we must forgive. My dad molested me, he forgived him. And I just looked at her and I just, I broke, you know, the Holy Spirit. It, it, I got baptised that night in the Holy Spirit and I just broke on the floor. That cool image dropped and I just burst. And that day I broke. Mm. God, God is so good, isn't it? Because he knows what you guys need. And probably you need something more than maybe some others. But mm. he knows what to bring to you and he knows how to speak to you and what to do in your life. And may God continue uh, to do that for you. Daniel. Bring us up to date with you okay. of, 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 of how you came to Christ. Well, from the age of 19, I've been praying to God. I don't know which God it was, but I was praying to God to... <laughs> whoever was there. Whoever, <laughs> whoever was there. Yeah. <laughs> show me a sign. Like, show me that you were there, like you've got my back, that you are true. I didn't really see any signs. So let's fast forward a bit. Got to university. First year I passed. And then Gavin got saved. So every day I'm in his car now, he's talking about God, but... <laughs> I wasn't really interested, so I'm listening to my music, yeah. just, just talking to myself to my music now, and he's going, take the headphones out, listen to what I'm saying. I'm like, I don't want to hear that right now, like, I don't want to hear it. But then one day it just hit me that God's got my back 24-7. He's never going to leave me. And to take my life to that step further, I need to give my life to him and show him that I'm committed to him. So mm. that's the step that I took. Mm. And has it been the same for you as, as with Gavin, that... You, yes, you make that commitment, he, he begins, but then you have to deal with quite a lot of stuff from the past. Yeah. And he knows the timing of it. He knows when you can do it. And you mm. can't do everything at once. It, it, has that been the same for you? It's the same, but God knows the problems that I'm going through. And me praying to God, and God knows my heart, so I can, how can I put it? I can get through the struggles. Yes with God. If I didn't have God, I couldn't get through any of these struggles, but by me saying to God, you know what, God, help me out. I'm in a sticky situation here. He will give me the learnings, like giving me Sheldon Thomas here to mentor me to get mm -hmm. through the problems that I've had right. and mm -hmm. take me to that next step where all of those things I used to do, it's out the window now. Right. And, and sorry, yeah, Karen. I was going to say that to, to the people that might be watching this programme, um, you're listening to Gavin and Daniel, but this is for everybody out there. We're, we're, we're letting you know that as gang members, you don't have to stay the same. There is a, a bigger purpose out there for you. And God has placed Tag in a very unique position to spread that gospel in a relative way to your circumstance. So I'll say to everybody that is out there watching this program, if there's any mothers out there who's struggling with their boy that's 15, 16, that comes in when he feels like it, it's telling her to shut up, slapping her about, we can help you to get out of that situation. We can help the whole family. But it's through God while we're doing this, mm. through God that we, we've got the strength and the mental understanding. And I say this, you've heard the testimonies. This is real life thing. People don't, you don't get this on normal TV. You don't get this on normal, you're getting this differently. You know why? Because God has a reason why he put all three of us through our back past. He put us there so that we can reach out to men like you, mm. to women like you, to parents like you, because that's why we're here. The Christian um, Christendom has got the answer to this. Why? Because we've got the word of God and God has raised up tag for that purpose. Don't, don't sit down and wait for, for a problem. Pick up the phone. We, you got our number. Phone us. We were here to give you advice. We're here to support and we're here to share the love of Christ. Because right now, if we don't have the love of Christ in our life, we ain't got nothing. And it's the love of Christ that took Gavin from road, took Daniel from road, took me from where I've come from. No matter what the decade is, no matter what the time is, it don't matter because God is timeless. Amen. Amen. Jesus is timeless. Amen. Amen. Um, and if you haven't got hold of any of the details, because I'm not sure how much we've been able to put up on the screen, do ring the office. Contact us here at the office, Revelation 0208 972 1400, and we will make sure uh, that you're put in contact with Sheldon and Tag and that those guys uh, can really help you. So don't just sit there doing nothing. Say, yes, we need help. We need help for our, our son. We need help for our daughter. We need help to, un to get out of the gang if you're in there. So make sure you do that. Um, uh, Gavin, what would you say? Somebody looking on here is in a gang, bit of a struggle like you were. What would you say to them? 
I would say to them, you know, truthfully, just like show them mentors me. And I would say one thing he did that was key, write down your issues. Identify what your issues are and take your identity to a deeper level, not your area, not your friends, but you. Like I was ashamed of my race. I found that Gavin McKenna is Pakistani and Irish. Gavin McKenna is a man of God, a child of the Most High. Once I identified with myself, I was then able to identify with others and take in what was relevant to me. Because when you don't have your own identity, you take in anything. So separate yourself from that negative stigma around you. Seek and understand and know that really, are your friends positively speaking into your life? Or is, is that gang gonna get you anywhere? I don't mean a millionaire. Right. You won't make the age to be a millionaire, I'm telling you now. You understand what I'm saying? And the fact that you're still alive watching this, mm. give glory to God. Mm. You know, the fact that I'm here, I give glory. So take your head out the, out the sand and ask yourself, are my friends benefiting me? If it's no, tomorrow if I die, I'm a guy in hell. If it's yeah, do I have a loving family? Yes or no? You've got one that are ready to love you mm. and one that will never let you down. Amen. So find out who you are, what pleases you, what's good and what's bad for you. Because we've all got common sense. Holding a gun is not good for you. Holding a Bible, it's, it's a better weapon, you know. It don't take a life, it brings a life. Mm -hmm. And it brings your life. <laughs> so let's get right, you know. You're sitting there saying amen, Dan, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Guys, uh, you, you've obviously given your lives to reaching out. To, to, to folks and um, that's what we pray that you'll continue to do. God will minister to you, God will bless you and, and, and use you in this work. Thanks very much guys for being with us today. I trust you've been challenged, encouraged, helped uh, with this. Make sure that you contact us, make sure that, you are th that they are there for you. Make sure you contact them. We'll see you again very soon. Bye for now.